Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Sheila Dunyu. I'm founder of Vero. We go around the world seeking small production wines and olive oils, not yet in the U.S. market. And we import them in and sell them to businesses and consumers around the U.S. Our website is verobinogusto.com. And I like to call our business a discovery platform since we, we bring in not only uh, wines and olive oils never in the U.S. before, but also we bring in um, these products from small producers who are unknown. And many times they're with varieties also that people don't know as well. And for that reason, I love involving Mary Beth Vieira, who is a wine educator with a company, Crush Course Wines, who will be leading our discovery today. And the special guest is Andrea Ivaldi, who you see there um, in his winery in uh, Asti Monferrato. So we've been doing this campaign for uh, about the area of Asti Monferrato, which is in Piedmont, Italy, right next to, let's say, the more famous uh, neighbor, the Lang. Um, and, uh, and one of the reasons, frankly, I wanted to do this campaign is for a couple of reasons. I mean, of course, Andrea, who, uh, whose wines are, are new to, to the U.S. market is, you know, one, one reason we just got his wines imported in for the first time um, in the U.S. in May. But also, um, also it's um, uh, a harvest time in, you know, at least the Northern he Hemisphere. And for in Piedmont, it's a especially celebratory time of year because they, uh, they also have a lot of festivals in the other parts of Italy as well. But I'd say Piedmont is just really like, you know, exploding with festivals. Um, so it's like with mushrooms and chestnuts and of course wine. So it's a great, you know, time of year to be able to be focusing on Piedmont. I wish I was there myself right now. Um, but, uh, and um, yeah, and then also um, what's interesting about Asimon Ferrato are the variety of, of wines as well. And given that we're in this transition period from summer to fall, it's, I, I, I think, kind of a nice time to think about, you know, different types of wines that you might, um, different styles that would also be good to pair, you know, with different foods and different occasions, et cetera, et cetera. So um, uh, we want to make this interactive. So for, for those of you on, on the Zoom, when, if you have a question, feel free to unmute yourself or write it in the chat. We also are streaming on Facebook. So anyone on Facebook, uh, if you have a question, just write it in the chat as well and we'll, uh, we'll address it. So, um, so I'll turn it over to Mary Beth now. Well, good morning. No, good afternoon. Good afternoon and good evening to everybody from across the United States and over the Atlantic and into Italy. Ciao, Andrea. Oh. Um, so good to see all of you here. I am just really um, honored to be asked to um, present today and to um, introduce you um, to Andrea. We'll be talking in both um, Italian and English. Um, Italian is his preferred native language, of course. And we're gonna be tasting these beautiful wines. So where are we? We are, as, um, as Sheila said, we're in the region of Asti Monferrato, which is a sub area of Piemonte. And uh, Piemonte, beautiful, renowned, world, uh, world renowned uh, region for wines. But we are in the Asti Monferrato and we're gonna be coming to you live. Andrea is from the town called Nizza Monferrato. And maybe that word Nizza might mean something to you. If not, it will in a few minutes. Here we are. Just take a look at what Sheila's talking about. Gosh, it would really be nice to be there. What a beautiful place to explore. What a beautiful place to live. What a beautiful place to be um, making wine. So really uh, Piemonte um, and this on the left, that big picture, that's kind of from the Asti Monferrato Hills, but you're viewing the Alps. So you're really, all of Piemonte is um, in a, um, a nice little shell uh, sheltered by the Alps rolling hills of vineyards. So next. And here we zoom in to where um, Andrea is coming to you from, his village where um, the um, Ivaldi winery is and where their 
12 hectares or most of their hectares of grapes are grown is in the um the around the village of Nizza Monferrato. So this is the lane going to their winery on the top left, more of their vineyards on the top right, and you can see the the village, the center, um, um, the piazza in the town of Nizza Monferrato, and in the bottom right there, um, every year they prepare for their um, winter and Christmas festival, you know, a month or so in advance, and they always put out something different um, overhead, and that's an ice skating rink right there. So what a wonderful place to visit. So here we are just to orient ourselves on the map. Here on the, the, the northwest uh, is Piemonte, again at the base of Valdosta, and to the right is, um, to the right or to the um, east is Lombardy and Milano, and just to the north is Liguria. So believe it or not, we've got, we have influence from the Alps, and we have influence pushing up from the sea in Liguria, in this protected area of lots of foothills um, and pre-Alps. Next. And this is um, just more of a geographic overview. So you can see what I'm talking about, um, how these foothills are in the base. It's keeping this warmth and protection. So you think it's so close to the Alps. So yes, um, there is fog and there are breezes that come down from the Alps, but it's also very, very warm because there's a lot of protection from um, the, northern, um, the northern winds by the Alps. Next. So again, here we are that way. This is just a zoom in so that you could see where uh, Piedmont or Piemonte is compared to the other wine growing regions. Next. And here we're zooming in. So where are we in um, Piedmont? We're in Asti. So what is, just in case um, the Piemonte is something new for you, um, the entire region is known for the most, the highest percentage, the most number of DOCG and DOC wines. So we're talking this entire region is the top quality wines. In fact, every vineyard that grows vines is either of DOC level or DOCG. There's no other region other than Piedmont um, in Italy that doesn't have an IGT um, region. So there's no IGTs in, in all of Piedmont. It's all quality level, but we're zooming in. We're going to kind of leave behind the area to the um, the the um, the west that gets all the press all the time. The um, the area of Alba. So we're leaving Barolo behind right now. We're leaving Alba behind. We're going to the more historic area just to the east, around the town of Asti, and in around Asti, we've got Nizza down below the river. You can see on this map that we're going to be focusing Barbera d'Asti, and we're going to be focusing on Nizza, which is also Barbera, but of super high quality. And down below in the pink, below Nizza, we're going to look at Bracchetto d'Aqui. And the whole area, basically all of the pinks and the green of Nizza and the Barbera d'Asti, that whole area, that's really the, um, the Monferrato um, Astigiane. This whole region is where we get the most beautiful, sweet wine, slightly fizzy in the world, Moscato d'Asti, the historic Moscato d'Asti. So we're going to be tasting today and talking to Andrea about his Barbera d'Asti, his Nizza, which is a Barbera, Bracchetto d'Asti, um, Moscato d'Asti, and it's not shown on here, but will be on a, a map soon, is the Alta Langa. The first wine we're going to taste is a sparkling wine. So here's just another picture of where the wine growing regions are. So Moscato d'Asti is everything, um, so the wine growing region is everything in the light purple, and in the dark purple is where Bracchetto. Um, so this is sweet wine growing right here. So we're going to be talking today what's wonderful about this region, this sub-region of Asti Monferrato, of the wines by um, produced by Andrea, um, fourth generation winemaker of the Ivaldi family. What is so beautiful is that we have all of these DOCG regions, diverse regions, growing grapes, producing wine for centuries, all close to each other. 
So this is such a, a, a premier um, territory for sun and for sandy calcareous soils and for rolling hills with perfect exposition to the to the sun. So for ripening, but keeping that minerality, the freshness, the coolness from those um, sandy soils, it's historic. So for 500 years, they've been making Moscato d'Asti, sweet, slightly sparkling wine in this region. And then Brachetto is the red grape it is also made into a sweet sparkling wine. So we're gonna be tasting all of those. Next. So we're gonna be talking a little bit, again, the, the key grapes for Andrea Barbera. 60% of their family's land is grown to Barbera. And then about 30% Moscato Bianco. And then the rest are a variety of grapes and Brachetto is one of them. So Barbera um, really grown all over the Piemonte, but I will argue when we talk about it that Barbera, that this is the key region for the most superior Barberas, Barbera d'Asti, Barbera Nizza, even more world renowned than um, Barbera d'Alba. And there's a reason for that. We'll talk about it in a second. And Moscato Bianco, historic. All right, so where is, where is um, Andrea? Right where that arrow is, you can see it is south. He is southeast of Asti and southwest of Alessandria, two um, key wine growing towns. And go to the next. It's just a little bit closer, um, zoomed in. And if you can see on the bottom left of the, the spot arrow, Canelli. Canelli is a famous region for uh, Moscato Bianco. In fact, Mos um, Muscat di Canelli is a famous name of, um, of the grape itself. So it comes from that town right there. Next. And you can see Nizza Monferrato is the main village and they're right outside of that. So you can just take a look around where Asti is. So if you wanna take a drive, that's where you go. And here is a picture outside of the home and cantina, um, which is also known as a winery in English, um, winemaking facilities of um, the Ivaldi family um, land. Next. And here's some pictures. Harvest just finished. Andrea, did it just finish or do we still have another day of picking? Andrea, che um, um, vendemia che um, va è ancora o è finito? È finito il 2 ottobre. So. Il primo ottobre. Ah, <laughs> it, first and second of October were the last days and celebration, everybody. Three days of rest. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> Tre giorni di riposa. Um, sì, sì. <laughs> a lot, a lot okay. of fermentation going on where you are. <laughs> Andrea. Uh, adesso, adesso cantina. <laughs> yeah, now it's look at the top right. This is where the uh, labor is going now into the winery. But I want to say, voglio dire, non ho dimenticato, non avevo dimenticato, mm. I did not forget, c'era un altro celebrazione il primo ottobre, no? Sì, sì. Si. Okay. 70 anni di mio papà. <laughs> His father celebrated 70 years on this earth. Happy birthday um, to Dario, um, uh, Andrea's father, Dario Ivaldi. October 1st, he was 70 years old. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Thank you. <laughs> Happy birthday. It all happened on the same day. So these uh, top right, we're going to talk to Andrea about these um, concrete tanks. Um, the, um, il, il cemento, sto parlando del ce, il, sì, il tasca di cemento, that came with the winery um, in 1921 when his family, when Guido, his um, great-grandfather, purchased the pro property um, and had a few acres of vines. It came with this small winery, it came with the house, and it came with these tanks. And that's where his great-grandfather, um, Guido, and great grandmother Francesca began making wine. So next. I think there's been a paint job since then, just so you know. An Andrea ha fatto un po' di pulizia dopo uh, 1920, vero? Sì, sì. And here is Andrea in his winery. There's a 
paint he's standing in front of some you know other um uh, uh cement or concrete tanks behind him and it's beautiful when you walk in there you see a panel of all of his um starting with guido um let me see guido pietro his grandfather dario his father and then himself right there um in a panel historically from left to right and so here we are andrea ciao sì. ciao <laughs> siamo pronti siamo pronti a parlare okay. e, e bere e assaggiare Okay, so I told them we're ready. We're ready for him. So, um, Andrea, I want to say, um, in addition, let me see what's the next slide. I don't think I need to show the next slide, but I can't remember what's there. Oh, okay. So uh, just go go back um, one. We'll get to that in a second. Um, so I just want to, as I'm introducing um, Andrea, he is fourth generation on this property. Um, Asti Monferrato not only is historic and historic from a winemaking perspective and a farming perspective, but it is absolutely beautiful. And in 2014, it was named a UNESCO World Heritage Site for the cultural heritage and beauty and connection of um, humans to nature and to winemaking. And the Barbera grape is part of it. So um, Asti Monferrato um, was named as well as the Lange and the Rorero were all regions that were put on the UNESCO World Heritage Site. So this is a beautiful area with a long tradition of winemaking and these DOCG um, premier wines. Um, I already said that um, we have, we're gonna be tasting five DOCG wines today that are all of Andreas and his families. And he is the fourth generation. They started with Barbera grapes, um, a couple of hectares when the property was first purchased, and some dolcetto. So at inizio sto dicendo che a 1920, quando il bisnonno Guido ha comprato, c'è un po' di Barbera e un po' di dolcetto. E dopo il tempo, and over time, Different. Um, so his then his grandfather Pietro added um, added grapes, added um, Moscato, um, and um, then his father added. Um, I'm sorry, his father added Moscato and um, Chardonnay. And what we have here, la, la cosa interessante, stavo per dire che um, di, di spiegare il tuo il tuo padre. Era la prima persona di, di andare in commercio, ma sì. tu è la pr prima persona di, di fare in bottiglia e, e... In bottiglia e di vendere all'estero, sì. Ok. So, what is interesting is the family has been making wine on this property from their grapes for four generations. And so his father, his great-grandfather Guido, was making wine for the family. You know, maybe neighbors would come by. Um, his grandfather, Pietro, um, sold a little bit of wine here and there to maybe restaurants, um, regions, people that were interested. It was his father, Dario, that first went commercial with the name of um, Ivaldi Dario for the winery, but was still selling it in Demijohns, was still selling it, you know, um, you know pulling a tap and people would, um, he would sell it in Demijohns. It was Andrea. Andrea, in two, 2010, I believe, if I have the right um, uh, year, um, no, 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 2001, when he was 20 years old, in 2001, he was the first generation to put the wine in bottles and to create a label and to sell it al estero, which means beyond Italian borders. So we really are looking at, even though he's fourth generation taking on the traditions and the heritage, he really is the um, an entrepreneur in this family and allowing us to get a taste of these wines. So with that being said, I wanna ask Andrea a couple of questions and then I'll open up the questions to um, all of you, Elaine, Mark, Elke, Claire, and anybody else um, on Facebook. Um, Andrea, um, 
siamo interessati a um, come mai um, hai scelto di stare, di restare su questa terra e continuare la tradizione e fare um, vino, e l'agricoltura con le uve, perché era possibile di andare e fare qualcos'altro. Um, dite qua, di, di, dire qualcosa a noi di questo. And I'm asking him, un attimo, um, traduco. I've asked him um, what made him stay with the family in winemaking and wine growing. He could have changed course. What made him stay and want to grow and dedicate his life to this? Andrea. Eh, da piccolo ho sempre visto mio papà e i miei nonni a produrre vino. Mi sono appassionato. Quindi, prima di tutto, l'ho fatto per la passione. Poi, per mantenere una tradizione, quindi continuare le, il lavoro fatto del mio nonno, mio bisnonno, mio papà. Quindi, non volevo interrompere questa cammina. E poi, perché volevo creare un mio vino. Quindi, come un artista crea un quadro, io ho creato un mio vino. Nonostante ci sono delle, dei, delle problematiche per quanto riguarda, non so, il clima, ma ci sono anche gli aspetti di conoscere nuova gente, far assaggiare il mio vino, la mia donna e farla conoscere anche in tutto il mondo. Bellissimo. Um, there's probably a few words, if you don't know Italian, there's probably a few words that jumped out there and one of them is passione, passion. So if that's the very first thing that he said, is it's really, it's, it's this passion. He was raised with his um, father and his grandfather in the winery, in the vineyard. So it was all around him. So he was already fascinated by it. Um, so it started with this heart and we're going to see how he took off with this passion. He really took it seriously. So, he, and he didn't, part of it was he didn't want to stop what the tradition they had made. He didn't want to be the one to stop it. So he wanted to keep it going. Um, he said there's also something he was motivated by the creativity. So I'm, I'm using the word, um, he said there's a little bit something artistic. So I think he's got the heart of an artist in him that was driving him to create something. And then because this is his family and they've been able to make such beautiful wines, he was proud. He wanted to keep the tradition going and wanted to be able to share the wines with the world. So um, stavo per dire la, sì. la tua storia un po' um, in, in um, um, uh, didattica. Grazie. So, um, Andrea, um, hey. with this passion, he went on and decided that he was going to take this seriously because he was going to eventually be in charge of, of everything. And his passion led him to, in Italy, when you get in high school, you actually already have to um, kind of claim a major um, in high school. And that would be kind of like the equivalent rather than when we wait till college in the United States. And he decided that it was agricultural and winemaking. So he went to an agricultural and winemaking um, school in Alba, I believe it was. Um, so high school was is five years. So he went to five years of high school dedicated to learning enology and grape growing and agriculture. And then after that, he went to college, which lasts three years, and he became an enologist in college. So there are many passionate producers and what we call winemakers around Italy, but they're not all trained enologists. Andrea is also an enologo. So he knows his stuff. He knows the land, he knows the soil, and he knows um, all the different choices to make wine. Ho spiegato un po' lungo, Andrea. Um, um, uh, Liceo per well. cinque anni, um, concentrato in um, Cantina Agricoltura Luva, e poi dopo um, che mm. lei è andato uh, all'università è, mm. è, è, è diventato um, en enologo, um, certificazione e tutto quello. Um, okay. Lei um, è andato a, a Asti o Alba per uh, l'università? Alba, Alba. Alba. Okay, so I was correct. It was it was Alba. Perfetto. Ho detto Alba. <laughs> non mi ricordavo. Era giusto. Bene. Um, and um, vo um, vorrei sapere. Um, sì. C'è una bilancia fra tradizione e innovazione. Quali sono le cose che um, sempre pensa um, 
to Andrea per la um, tradizione e la novità, la moder modernazione. I'm asking un attimo. I'm asking him um, with being fourth generation, there's always a balance between uh, there must be because he's a family and winery between tradition and innovation and, and modernity. How does he what does he see in each of those categories? Cosa cosa? Um, allora, sulla, su, sul piatto della tradizione, intanto mantenere la tipicità del, del vitigno, quindi produrre vino 100% monovitigno in botte di cemento o in botte grandi di legno come la tradizione. E questa è la parte della tradizione. L'innovazione è cercare, come anche in alcuni progetti che sto aderendo, l'innovazione per quanto riguarda mantenere il vino cercando di utilizzare meno attrezzature meccaniche o attrezzature meccaniche innovative, piuttosto che utilizzare magari con nuove tecniche meno solfiti, meno additivi e cercare di il vino sempre naturale senza utilizzare troppo la chimica. Adesso ci sono nuovi sviluppi per mantenere un vino vivo senza utilizzare metodi tradizionali. Ok, ok. The, um, what he's talking about in the um, tradition, what they've always kept in the tradition, are um, healthy grapes on the vine, starting with that. So with an eye to, these are our grapes, this is our land, keeping our land intact with beautiful um, grapes that have a lot of, of ripeness and richness, especially for the, um, the sweet wines. Um, then moving into the cellar, it is those concrete tanks. The wines are made in concrete tanks per tradition. So thinking about and in large um, large vats, large tanks of wood that are older. So the whole point is to give it the age and the richness um, and the roundness without adding any extra flavor. So that is the tradition that he has kept all the way from the beginning. I mean, those exact same tanks as well. Um, Then when we move, and so that's something that's going to be a through line to the flavors that we should have here. There's not going to be anything that's going to taste like oak. We're not going to have that type of an influence. It's about maintaining the freshness and the, um, the, the quality of the grape, showing the terroir and showing the vintage. Now we go to the modernità, modern winemaking methods. He's really been looking, um, you know, obviously, you know, in the in the 70s or whatever, they moved to um, temperature controlled tanks. So that obviously is keeping up with um, modernity. But what he's doing now is um, uh, moving also to maintaining and following the practices of sustainability. He's certified sustainable and going beyond doing a lot of practices that are organic, but doesn't have the certification. But he's going beyond that. And can you show the next slide, Sheila? Yep. Hold on a minute. Certifications here. Go back to sharing. So on the left, the bottom left, that's just the um, general certification for the region for uh, the UNESCO World Heritage Site. I thought I would put that in there. Top left is um, SQNPI, Certified Sustainable. Um, and then there's all kinds of um, uh, developments on the right that he has been recognized, that his land has been recognized for maintaining um, and developing the agricultural land, but in a natural way. Um, so he has received this um, respect and the MIPAEF is about maintaining the agricultural land. Have any of you heard of regenerative agriculture practices, regenerative farming? Um, it goes a couple of steps beyond organic, which organic really kind of focuses on no pesticides um, and no um, uh, fertilizers. And there's great things, it's absolutely wonderful. What regenerative agriculture does is about not maintaining the soil what it is, but improving. So looking for ways to in, improve the soil, make sure that it keeps improving, um, everything from multi crops to not disturbing the topsoil and to um, keep the moisture um, in the land, keep the moisture um, there. And Andrea had, you know, talked to us about, you know, there's been a lot of drought. 
uh, Sicita, Sicita. There's been a lot of drought across um, northern Italy for the last several years, and even this year, it's there's drought in Piemonte. But his and and in his region, whereas in Bologna there was rain, in August it was still very dry. But if you can maintain the health of the soil and the and the the water that's there, and he's been doing this over the years, um, not touching the soil, not tilling the soil, um, finding natural methods. It, it makes a difference not only in the legacy of the land, but in how delicious the wines are. And I kind of want to turn it over to you, Sheila. Do you want to say or do you want me to say on your behalf um, what you had thought and what you discovered? And Andrea, sto parlando un po' di, del um, organico um, and um, regenerative agriculture, di non disturbare la terra, di mantenere ma uh, fare sviluppo. Uh, yeah, so when I was talking to Andrea um, a couple days ago, I was asking him, um, well, I actually was, was explaining how when um, I went with uh, a, co a colleague uh, in January to visit him, we also went to some um, neighboring uh, wineries. And at the end of the, our, vi our visit, uh, um, we, you know, we were talking my colleague and I like, um, you know, I mean, of all, out of all the wines we tasted, Andrea's were the ones that we remembered, like our, the taste actually was uh, very vivid and, and, and good, um, you know, and, and I must say better than, than at the neighboring wineries that we visited. And when I asked Andrea about this and I was asking, well, maybe it's the soil or this or that. And he commented in that, you know, his approach to farming being regenerative um, and using or organic mat matter to protect the soil and not, and not using um, uh, a lot of uh, you know machinery in, in the uh, in, in the vi vineyards that that um, in his opinion is one reason why his his uh, his wines are better. So yeah, so that was one of the things that Sheila said to me is what is it that makes the, you know, I was just struck when she first discovered the Evaldi wines about how fresh they were and how alive and beautiful the flavors were. And so she thought there must be something different with the subsoil. Well, it wasn't that it's different, you know, the, the land is not different in general. Um, other people have slopes, other people have sandy calcareous soil, but he's taking care of it. So I think it might be time to start tasting. What do you think? Because we've just, got five uh, wines. If we can uh, just answer a question that Mark oh, yeah. has. Um, sure. So he's asking, uh, he would like to know from Andrea about his uh, concerns about global warming. If you want, I can, I can ask him directly. Okay. And, Good then, um, and then how this has affected his, his, his um, viticultural practices. Quindi Andrea, abbiamo una domanda dal nostro mio amico sommelier um, Mark che chiede, eh, che chiede in generale l'impatto sulle clime e uh, quindi le um, iniziative che hai, hai, hai fatto per combattere il cambiamento delle clime, tipo la sacietà. E, uh, e poi magari se hai qualche preoccupazione anche su, su questo argomento. Allora, il clima in questi... Io mi ricordo quando avevo dieci anni che si iniziava la vendemmia il 15 di settembre. Quest'anno è iniziata il 20 di agosto. Quindi nel giro di 20 anni, 30 anni è proprio il clima. E anni che c'è una siccità piuttosto elevata. Per il momento, avendo dei terreni piuttosto argillosi, la poca acqua invernale ha tenuto e ha fatto sì che la pianta portasse a termine la maturazione. Il problema è che noi qua non abbiamo, non c'è la possibilità di irrigare, non abbiamo acqua ed è quasi impossibile irrigare il vigneto. Si può intervenire a livello eh, agronomico. Invece di lasciare 12 tralci, dovremmo lasciarne solo 6. 
bisogna ridurre la parete vegetativa oppure arrivare a fare l'alberello come si dice quindi due o tre grappoli per vite bisogna se continua questa siccità cambiare la, la forma di allevamento e ridurre il numero di grappoli so, um, so what Andrea uh, said and, and Mary Beth feel free to elaborate but um, mm -hmm. Uh, first of all, yes, uh, the, he, he, they've definitely he's definitely witnessed the, the change, um, climate, climate change impacts. So when he was 10 years old, he, they used to harvest in the middle of September. And this year they harvest, they started harvesting on the 20th of August. Um, and, um, and, and then uh, I, to, let's say, Uh, combat this, you know, this, these impacts. Uh, he, he mentioned that um, having um, uh, cl clay soils is definitely uh, a help. Um, uh, Mary Beth, ar argilloso, yeah. so I interpret as clay, right? Argilloso yes. is clay? Yeah. Um, so having cl clay soils uh, definitely helps. Um, But, uh, but in, with respect to the, the drought that they're experiencing, um, they, they really uh, have, he really has to focus on, 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 on lowering his yields and, and also considering um, a change to the, the training system and, and focus on uh, more on Abarello, Abarello, is uh head, head trained head trained yeah um head, head trained formation um which has um also has has lower yields yeah they can't it's just impossible to irrigate there and intervene in certain ways so they have to go through from an agronomist standpoint and so how can we work with the vine to where it will need less water basically um And that would be to drop more fruit um, or continue on growing um, fewer um, fewer vines per you know per hectare. Um, and then, as she said, we may have to go to um, at least the method of head trade and vines. You know where there is even if they don't go to head train where there's only two or three bunches um, per vine. And so, yeah, good question. Are there so other that's going to that's going to result in higher prices at some point? Secondo te Andrea si alza anche i prezzi in futuro uh, riguardo al fatto che per esempio la produzione di, diminuisce? Eh lì eh, do, dovrebbe aumentare, poi questo purtroppo il mercato cambia di anno in anno. Sicuramente ci sono dei costi più elevati per, per noi produttori, quindi dovrebbe di conseguenza aumentare anche il prezzo dell'uva, ma questo non si sa. I prezzi di, di lavorazione sì, aumenteranno o comunque diminuisce la quantità di uva, quindi cambia il rapporto. So basically, però, sì, sì. Uh, fa però... faccio prima una, una sintesi e poi uh, continuo Andrea. So he basically was saying that, um, that for sure his prices like now are going up. I mean, of course, I'm, I'm sure that's also for, for other reasons, but, um, but yes, this, is, uh, this impact is, is uh, what will cause him to, um, you know, to have higher, higher costs overall. But he, he also is mindful frankly, of what, um, of what the market, you know, uh, calls for. So it's that, that balance. Delicate balance. Yeah. yeah. E volevo dire, Andrea? Thank you. Grazie. No, che se da una parte aumentano, tra virgolette, i costi, diminuisce la quantità di uva, ma diminuisce anche il lavoro, perché se c'è questo clima, si fanno meno lavorazioni, meno lavori in vigneto e quindi è un po' un tutt'uno che alla fine rimane in equilibrio. Okay. So he was just saying that when there's lower yields, frankly, there also is less, uh, it's less resource intensive for him. So that does 
allow them a little see, bit of balance. Yeah, yeah. Just balance the cost. Yeah. Don't need as much labor for fewer grapes, mm -hmm. so it should balance out. Yeah. Uh, altitudine, Andrea? La mia azienda va dai 250 ai 270 metri. So that's uh, he just said his um the altitude of his vineyards vary from 200 meters to 270. So okay. should we start tasting? Well, I don't want my Andrea to get cold. I'm get cold. <laughs> oh no, it we is have cold. Andrea. I don't want it to get. So let's skip the Barbera slide. Let's go here. We'll go back to that Barbera slide when okay. we introduce the Barberas. How's that? Okay. So I'm. If any of you have the Andrea in front of you, I just uh, popped the cork this morning. I couldn't resist a tiny sip at the time. <laughs> so take a look at this. And, you know, I had not had anything else. I'd just woken up this morning. I was like, oh my God, lovely. <laughs> That's breakfast. <laughs> so make sure that you can see the bubbles and the color coming out. So um, let's look at where, first of all, where is Alta Langa? Um, you can see it on the map on the bottom there, and it really covers a wide area um, to the, the southern part of the um, Asti Monferrato area. So Castel Roquero, Canelli is covered, Aquiterme, but then it really goes quite broad. So we're getting in down into the foothills that are starting to go into Liguria. And when we get down here, we're really only about 30 kilometers, as the crow would fly, from the sea. So there's some cool winds that come in here. And so let's see what Alta Langa, who's, who's heard of Alta Langa? Yep. Okay, yep. not everybody's got their uh, their uh, video on. Um, so I don't know how many people are raising their hand, but good for you. Um, yep. And if not, it's okay, because this has only been a um, DOCG since 2011. Next slide. Oh, I see a thumbs up, Elaine. <laughs> <laughs> Next slide. So it is a traditional method sparkling wine. What is so cool about this Alta Langa? Maybe it's only been a DOCG since uh, 2011, but it is arguably the first traditional method sparkling wine made in all of Italy. So per tradition, it's been made in this region from Chardonnay grapes, from Pinot Noir grapes since the 19th century. And, um, uh, Francia Corta um, came later in the um, uh, early in the 20th century. So the um, Andrea Alta Langa is a DOCG. Um, this is, and every Alta Langa is vintage dated, and it has to be made with Chardonnay or with Pinot Noir or a blend of the two. This is an extra brut, 100% Chardonnay, and per regulations, it's 30 months on the lees. Where he's growing the grapes is um, they also have some property in Castel Bologna. Um, wait, Bolo did I pronounce? Did I did I just say Bologna? Bologna. <laughs> it's, it's not Bologna. Sorry, I used to live in Bologna, and I this in my head. It's it's uh, Castel Bologna. It should be B O L B O G G B O G B O G. Yes. Oh, B O G. B O G. L A. L I. B O G L I O N E. There. And then put a no. Okay. Bollone. Castel Bollone. Sorry about that. Um, Castel Bollone is um, within the Alta Langa. So this area, the grapes are now, they face a little bit more, a little bit more towards the north, a little bit cooler climate. It gets a little bit more human there to maintain freshness. So um, I will let Andrea, Andrea um, uh, dice qualcosa su questo amore. By the way, do you guys know where he got his name, the name of the wine from? <laughs> it's from Andrea himself. So he is the first to make, he's the first to make an Alta Langa from his family. <laughs> so and, Andrea, tell us about <laughs> your passion with this wine. Di, dite qualcosa della passione è interessante 
eh, cosa sta, state cercando um, in, in this wine? What are you looking for in this grape? Why is it your passion? What do you love about it? Let's taste. Allora, in questo vino, intanto, beh, me lo sono dedicato col nome Andrea. È stata un po' un'innovazione sia per la zona, per la cantina, primo sfumante che è stato creato nella mia famiglia, quindi ho voluto fare anche una cosa moderna. Per noi la bollicina, per il Piemonte, ma soprattutto per noi, è una, una, un po' una novità, quindi ho voluto creare questa bolla per, per fare anche un vino un po' giovanile, no? uscire un po' dagli schemi, dalla tradizione, e devo dire che piace. E anche oggigiorno la bollicina viene bevuta da tutti. Se è un vino rosso, deve essere già un appassionato, un qualcuno che ama i vini. La bolla accomuna i ragazzi giovani fino all'anziano. Quindi crea poi, è un vino che crea comunque anche gioia, festa, proprio la bolla è allegra. All right. So um, it was something that his family was making and it was time to, you know, put it out there. It was, it was new for his family to have it on the label. It was new to Piemonte and they wanted to follow the trend because everybody, everybody, especially now is enjoying bubbles. Um, especially the young, um, the younger generations are attracted to bubbles, want to have bubbles. Um, and he wanted to have that part of the family tradition and, and bringing it into the tradition. And so he's dedicating it, putting his name on it as this is the introduction of something new. So it's named after, after himself, after his creation. So um, what he has told me is that he leaves these, you know, this isn't a cooler, uh, a, a cooler plot, a cooler um, area of the vineyard, but he, he also leaves it on the vine longer. So that coolness allows for slow ripening, which becomes, you know, very ripe, which you can, you can notice in here. It's round and creamy yet balanced with acidity and fine bubbles. So for those of you that have it, you know, take a, a, a sniff and a swirl and taste it and let, you know, let us know if you have any thoughts on it before I start describing or Sheila starts describing or Andrea. Anybody have any, any thoughts on this wine? Yeah, I don't, I don't think anyone has it <clears throat> um, with them um, other than Andrea. Andrea, si. stai assaggiando? Eh no, c'ho il telefono. Ho tengo il telefono assaggio. <laughs> So I was asking asking if Andrea is tasting, but I, I must, I'll just make a quick comment um, that uh, when I, I went to visit Andrea uh, the first time to his winery and, and when we started the tasting, he had just bottled this, uh, this 2018, um, it, it is a vintage um, champagne style sparkling wine. And, um, and it was probably around 10 in the morning. Um, and it was really like great wine to hit your palate at that hour, you know, because it was just, I remember the, the freshness, the, bu the bubbles were just really, you know, really pleasing, like uh, the whole experience in, in my mouth, um, you know, as well as the fruit. Well, I had the same um, uh, experience and I wasn't planning on tasting it this morning. I, I just, I wanted to make sure I waited till today to make sure I maintain the bubbles perfectly. So I did it this morning and I was like, whoa, it's perfect for breakfast. So there's just this, um, really this liveliness. My mouth is just continuing to water, but with juiciness, not with strong acid. It's like the flavors are just lasting and lasting and, and juicing up here. And so there's, um, there's like chamomile on the nose. There's some white flowers. There's definitely chamomile here. There's a little bit of um, kind of a lemon rind. But on the palate, hmm. somewhere between a, a green and a golden delicious apple. So it's got it's got kind of the um, the flavors of both, kind of like that brightness of a, of a green apple, but the ripeness of a golden delicious apple with a little bit of a lemon curd 
Um, and it's just very, very refreshing and juicy. And I, I have to, I had to bring my spit cup or else I might not make it because it's very drinkable. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Andrea, um, che, um, certi um, aromi o um, texture, um, le cose che sta cercando o che um, piace a questa, uh, che, che voi che altri um, farò nota um, in questo vino? Come aromi, come profumi? Tutto, uh, la bocca, tutto. Allora, i profumi, eh, ricordo un po' i frutti, i fiori gialli come il tarassaco, anche il zafferano, il cipollino di zafferano. In bocca eh, invece eh, si presenta con un'acidità ma non troppo sostenuta, eh, lasciando maturare bene le uve esce anche questo colore un po' più giallo rispetto al classico bianco e ehm, sempre lasciando maturare queste uve abbiamo in bocca una sensazione cremosa, grassa, con una struttura, con una bolla non troppo spinta, abbiamo solo 5 di atmosfere invece di 6 o 6 e mezzo. Quindi ho creato uno spumante bilanciato, non troppo acido, non troppo morbido, non troppo forte, di... tenendo presente che ha solo un grammo litro di zucchero come residuo. Quindi è morbido perché ho lasciato maturare bene le uve e, tu e tutte sostanze grasse che si sono formate durante la vinificazione. Ok. One of the first things he talked about was the, the color, noticing that the color is more yellow than you see in other traditional methods, sparkling wine. And that was leaving those grapes on the vine longer, gives them that more golden color. So that's one of the things that we're noticing here. Um, and he also um, enjoys and, you know, finds the yellow, ripe yellow fruits here um, and the um, and saffron. So he's getting like a saffron flavor, a saffron aroma. Um, and he's going for and appreciates about this, that there's acidity there, but it's not too much. And that um, ripe, that round, that roundness on the palate, kind of a creamy roundness on the palate, kind of satin. So he's not going for a super bubbly wine. There's only five atmospheres of pressure um, and, and it's one gram per liter of uh, residual sugar. So there's a little bit of softness in there too. So and Mary Beth, we have a question um, from uh, Elka who is asking um, two things. So one of them is uh, at what bricks level does Andrea pick? Um, so I'll just go ahead and ask him. Okay. Um, Andrea, quando fai la, la vendemmia, per esempio, di que, questo vino, uh, fai una misura di bricks, uh, segui bricks, come? Noi seguiamo il babo. Comunque, quando sono circa 200 grammi di litro di zucchero residuo. No, alla raccolta, alla raccolta, quanti, sì, alla raccolta. quanti 200 litri? Grammi, 200 grammi di litro di zuccheri. I don't know how to translate that to bricks. Um, quindi 200 gram, grammi di, di ah, zucchero ah, per litro? Sì, e che okay. arrivi a una gradazione base di 12 gradi e mezzo di alcol. Okay. Poi con la gradazione siamo a 13, 13 e mezzo. Ok. So, uh, so elk, um, they, they don't, he doesn't use bricks uh, as a measure exactly. He uses just how many grams of sugar per, per liter. Um, and, um, and he, with the goal of, of arriving at 12 and a half, uh, percent alcohol. Um, ma, ma, Andrea, dato che fai la vendemmia un po' più tardi, significa sì. che il, il zucchero è un po' più alto, giusto? No, eh, quest'anno è stata anticipata proprio per evitare di salire troppo con lo zucchero. Per quello abbiamo iniziato il 20 di agosto. Nel 2021 abbiamo fatto il primo settembre, quindi mm -hmm. cambia a seconda delle annate, ma è sempre pr la prima uva a essere raccolta. Ok. So this is always the, uh, the first grapes that are picked are for this, and this year they actually, because they didn't want to get it too ripe, they decided to pick on the 20th of August, so they picked it early. 
to maintain that. So when they picked it, when he picked it, it was 200 grams per liter, you know, um, projected. And then um, with after um, after the vinification, one gram per liter in the bottle. Okay. All right. And and then uh, uh, Elk also has a question about um, whether he uses wild yeast or if he um, if he in inoculates or uh, or adds yeast. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'll, I'll ask him. Okay. Andrea, per questo vino uh, aggiungi lieviti per fermentare? Per la seconda rifermentazione, sì. Primo no. La prima no, la seconda per forza. È obbligatorio, se no. So the, so the first fermentation is, uh, is a, a native yeast, you know, wild yeast fermentation. And then, uh, and then for the second fermentation in the bottle, he, he adds, he adds yeast. And I, I would say we can ask him for his other wines as, as we're going through them. But when I've asked him in the past, um, he, he, he definitely prefers uh, a, a, a wild, you know, a native yeast fermentation in general with his wines. Um, so. And um, yeah, and then um, Mark was asking about, um, biodynamic uh, farming. So I'll, uh, I'll, I'll ask him. Um, Andrea, um, in, in English, for example, in the United States, we have a lot of, we have a lot of the biodynamic. I don't know how to translate in Italian. Biodynamic. Ah, facile, easy, biodynamic. <laughs> <laughs> I could have guessed that. Um, e quindi, uh, puoi, tu, tu puoi uh, essere considerato biodinamico? No, oh, no, no, no. No, biodinamico c'è tutta una preparazione prima del corno, di letame messo sottoterra, che si crea una certa una certa energia, poi loro seguono le lune, non usano proprio neanche nessun tipo di trattamento, invece io li uso, quindi seppur in modo leggero li uso. No, no, io non sono, sono quasi biologico, diciamo, ma non biodinamico. So, um, so Mark, he, in, in the true, con, his, his response is, is really in line with, um, uh, what is it? Uh, De Demeter, if I'm not mistaken. Um, uh, who who's the um, the the German? Is that the, the German guy? Rudolf Steiner. Rudolf Steiner. Yeah. So his response to your the question about biodynamic farming is uh, responding to that strict definition of I I would say what Rudolf Steiner has um, you know uh, has brought forward, and he he does not follow the Rudolf Steiner philosophy, you know, following the moon and uh, various aspects regarding energy, etc. Um, he considers himself um, almost uh, organic. Like that's, uh, that's how he, he consider his farming. Mm -hmm. yeah. So um, yeah, feel free to um, Ask any questions in the chat or unmute yourself. I guess we should go to the next wine, right? Yeah, I think so. So we're going to move on to our reds, right? So if yep. you can see the next slide. Uh, there it is. Okay. Well, it was actually this. There was a slide right? before. Yeah. There. Okay. okay, so we're going to look at two. Look at. We're going to taste. Hopefully a few of you are also tasting. Um, we're going to taste and we're going to compare two famous, traditional, yet modern, um, Asti, um, I'm sorry, Barberas. Okay, so we're going to have the Picona first, and we're going to have the Nizza next. And there's some, um, they're both uh, DOCGs, but first I want you to go back um, two slides to the one on Barbera, just a quick review of Barbera, so we're all on the same page. Um, 
Barbera is indigenous to Piemonte and it is the most planted variety in Piemonte. So it has really grown all over the region. Um, the wines that we find this grape in in the region are DOCG levels, Barbera d'Asti, which we're going to taste, Nizza, which we're going to taste, and Barbera del Monferrato Superiore, for example. DOC wines, um, Barbera d'Alba, you know, the other region, the Alba region that's over there to the west, that's a DOC wine, and Barbera del Monferrato are DOC wines. So what do we expect from Barbera other than it's a red grape. The acidity is high. It's known for really high acid. The tannins are known to be low on the moderate side for a red, very, very moderate. So what you find in different regions in um, uh, Italy, in, in some regions and some producers, and what you find in the United States is because a lot of people like tannins, um, a lot of producers don't honor necessarily in the United States, um, don't necessarily honor the grape and they put it in um, new wood to try to add tannins and add texture. So if you want to add tannins, add texture, you give it some, some wood aging. But in general, it's high acid, moderate tannins, and the body is light, you know, light to full bodied with medium to high alcohol. And what's on the nose? What are the flavors that it brings? Um, really berry fruits, cherry, raspberry, blueberry, blackberry, and um, minerality. So it's usually a very juicy, quaffable wine that can be made entry level all the way up to very robust and very serious. So let's go to the next slide. Um, it's the one about the wine, right? Yeah. Okay. So what are we going to have here? We're going to have the Barbera Dusty. DOCG. So as long as it's within the growing within the confines of that larger Osti region and it follows the discipline, you know, the disciplinary, it can be a DOCG. So um, basically the Monferrato Hills around Asti. So here's the cool thing. Why I said and gave a preview at the beginning of why the region that we're in here in the Monferrato Asti area is known for the highest quality, the most acclaimed um, Barbera's is because here, this whole region, Barbera gets the best vineyard sites. It gets the most premier position on the slope. Whereas, what do you guys think? I mean, put it in the chat. What happens, you know, or, or, or just belt it out. What happens when you just move over to the Alba region and the Barolo region does what gets the, uh, the premier spots? Nebbiolo gets the premier spots. And really, when we're talking about the, um, the larger Longa in general, but especially in the Barolo region and Alba, it's, it's kind of becoming monoculture there. When we're in the Asti Monferrato, there's forests around, there's general agriculture, there's hazelnuts, almond trees, peaches, pomegranates, um, and there's a variety of grapes, as I talked about. But Barbera gets the, the most premier um, size. It's taken the most seriously. So already when you're getting Barbera Dosti DOCG, you know you're getting high quality. The Picona that we're tasting today is a 2020. And the Picona is the name of the vineyard. And this one gets a mid-slope um, growing location. And what we're trying to achieve here, I'm jumping down to the style. Um, Andrea um, has shared with me that he's looking to respect the Barbera grape. So he's really trying to show off the Barbera grape. Everything is about maceration 12 days in the concrete tanks and is aged 10 to 12 months in concrete tanks. There's not any, um, it there's, doesn't see wood at all. So the style should be that fresh uh, berry fruit, wild cherry raspberry, um, high acidity, which are all characteristics of Barbera the grape. Andrea, ho raccontato un po' di um, Barbera d'Asti in generale e questo vino e il, lo stile che volete arrivare. Um, C'è qualcos'altro e quando beviamo? Sì, allora questa è la Barbera, io la definisco la tradizionale, la storica, come è sempre stato fatto in Piemonte col suo bel colore rosso rubino, 
i profumi che ricordano i piccoli frutti rossi un po' acidoli come il ribes, la marena selvatica, piuttosto che eh, non so, il lampone. In bocca appunto si sente questa acidità, ma con questi anni, con questi ultimi tre anni molto caldi, abbiamo anche un po' più di tannino, una bella struttura, un bel corpo e fanno sì che dura nel tempo. Ho aperto una barbera di vent'anni fa, dove ha perso un po' il colore e quasi assomigliava a un barbaresco, a un nebbiolo. Ed è proprio scritto nei libri di storia che nelle annate migliori la barbera baroleggia, assomiglia molto a un barolo. Ah, bellissimo. Era vostro? Era vostro? Il, il mio, ma anche le barbere in generale. Con sì, quelle, sì, sì. Con okay. le barbere che dura nel tempo tendono a diventare quasi come un barolo, cioè perdono quel colore, esce il tannino e ho fregato dei miei amici, gli ho fatto una sfida <ride> e hanno pensato, pensavano che era barolo e invece era barbera. Oh, bellissimo! Um... So, um, you know, he's saying that he was going, he's going for the tradition here. This is the most traditional grape in Piemonte. Um, ruby red fruits, tart ruby red fruits of all this, the, you know, the small um, fruits. Um, and, <clears throat> excuse me, um, like raspberry. Um, that it usually leans on the tart side and, you know, acid is the first thing that you taste. But um, in the last few years, it's been warmer. So they've, the uh, grapes have been creating thicker skins and therefore they've been a little bit more tannic than they usually have been. So um, it's got a nice um, extra body on it in the last couple of vintages. But one thing I got to take a sip. This was a funny one. Funny, beautiful. Um, so he opened up a Barbera Dasti who's 20 years old and he poured it for his friends and for himself. And he'd seen, you know, obviously after that time, the color had fallen out, but there was still um, structure and life and acid in there. He said that it tasted like a Barolo and all of his friends, he'd poured it blind and he fooled them. They all thought it was an aged Barolo. So Barbera really can live up to some aging with that acid there. It can have long life. And it can be a very serious, expressive wine when it's grown in the right, under the right conditions and treated with care. This was another one I snuck a, a sip maybe an hour later this morning. Or no, it was a couple hours later. Mm. It's like... There's a there's a ripeness of almost, you know how like there'd be like a, a raspberry compote, but not the sweetness going to it. So there's the the flavor intensity of the fruit at its core, but there's texture on my palate. So I'm noticing, I'm noticing that that layer of of tannins in there that is just lovely along with the acidity and the juicy fruit. Mm. So we, we just got a, we had a question from, from El, Elke and John. Um, I met them at a local uh, retailer uh, called The Cave here in Ventura mm. that ca carries um, um, uh, Andrea's uh, Moscato d'Asti at the moment. Uh, not yet, uh, the Barbera. But, uh, but in any case, uh, at, at, at this wine tasting um, where I met uh, Elke and John, um, there was a, um, there was this wine, um, the Barbera um, Picona from Andrea, and then there was a Barolo, and, and this was a tasting um, wh whereby no one was eating, <laughs> you know, you were just like tasting wine, uh, so that, I'm giving that context because, uh, as you probably know, a lot of wines in in, in Italy, uh, as well as other European countries are, are very food friendly. But in any case, uh, the, this woman uh, tastes the picona and she just loves it. She mm -hmm. just is raving about it. And then she tries the Barolo and she's like, she didn't like the Barolo. She preferred, preferred this picona. And I think that, that, that g gives you the context about this wine. It's just great for just even just drinking on its own, uh, fresh and fruity. Um, I mean, I, obviously I'm, I'm enjoying it. 
It's fabulous. On the nose, when you go in, there's kind of this, um, there's a little bit of an earthy quality to it. And um, and and almost, um, it's almost like there's a, some darker fruits on the nose or some um, um, flowers. But on the palate, it's just alive and it's juicy and it's got structure. It's got beautiful balance. And this is another one that a um, little bit dangerous because I would just like to keep sipping it. <laughs> it's very good. So it would, it's great on its own, but it would be lovely um, with pizzas, a wide range from white pizzas to, you know, even a, you know, spicy or pepperoni with the oil in there because you've got the, the texture and you've got the, um, the acidity, but, uh, and uh, pastas and um, a, a wide range. I would like to see this with um, braised meats as well. Lovely. Questions? comments about the wine. Mm. Mary Beth. Yes. This is Elka Foss. Um, I want to respond to Sheila. Sometimes what happens with people also when they're not used to a style of wine, because our California wines are so different than European wines in terms of stylistically. So unless you're um, exposed to a lot of those different styles of wine, regarding what you said about the Barolo, because that, the Barbera, we're very used to in terms of what that should, that, that flavor profile is. And the Barolo is mm -hmm. quite a bit different. I agree. I agree with you. Okay. Our palates are not quite ready. Um, many palates yeah. for the high acid and the, um, the gripping drying tannins of, yeah. um, and that's why when we travel, we drink local and we drink a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You're, you're used to it. Yeah. You want to discover. Good. Yes. All right. If there's no other comments on this one, shall we go to the Nitsa and talk about why that one is so cool? Okay. And this is the wine that we're moving to next. 1613 and you see how on the bottom of the bottle the only word you see is Nizza it doesn't even say it says denominazione origine controllato controllata e garantita but it does not say oh there it is it does not say Barbera anywhere and that's because we're supposed to know that Nizza Nizza used to be a, um, it's a historic area for a reputation for super high quality Barbera. So it's in the heart of Nizza Monferrato, but it used to be Barbera d'Asti Superiore. So it used to be a sub region that could put Superiore on the label. So there were a few different sub regions of Barbera d'Asti that you could put, it used to be Barbera d'Asti Superiore dash Nizza, but it elevated it the producers got together and petitioned and not only elevated it to its own DOCG, but elevated it with some even stricter um, requirements of aging, of ripeness, um, et cetera. So the production rules for Nizza, again, you can see um, Nizza Barbera DOCG, or you can just see Nizza. They're the same thing. The producer can decide what they want to put on the label, but it must be 100% Barbera where there's a little bit of wiggle room on the Barbera d'Asti and it must be minimum 18 months total aging and six in oak. Um, Andrea, sto parlando um, solo adesso per uh, cose Nizza, prima di uh, parlare del, del vostro vino. C'è qualcosa che volevi aggiungere o ho spiegato abbastanza bene? Si chiamava prima Barbera d'Asti Superiore, Poi hanno visto che la zona migliore della Barbera è proprio Nizza e i suoi paesi limitrofi e hanno deciso di dare il nome come al, al vino come il paese, così come era stato fatto 60 anni fa col Barolo. Nella zona del Barolo il Nebbiolo esprime al meglio le proprie caratteristiche e ha dato il nome del territorio. Perfect. I mean, that's it. He just got the, got the nugget of it. You know, this comes down to um, pride tradition and and marketing behind what the 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 wine that you believe in in your region the very best barbera's 
came from Nizza historically. So over in Barolo, it wasn't always called, the wine wasn't always called Barolo, you know, but now the name of Nebbiolo from the best region is called Barolo. What we're going to be doing here, the best Barbera is called Nizza. So eventually that's going to stick a little bit more. Um, this 1613 Nizza Barbera, it's a DOCG. 2017 is the year. Um, the um, Andrea chose the brand name um, 1613 because that is a year where I don't remember which country, which Huns were coming in and where they were going to take over. Um, they were battening uh, down the head, um, from trying to take Mantua. over. Mantua. From Ma Mantua. Oh, the Mantovani. Oh, the bad yeah. Mantovani. We're coming in and they were trying to take control of the village of Nizza Monferrato. And when all was lost, when they thought all was lost and they were going to have to give up the forts and let the, you know, the Mantovani in to take over, miraculously, this lamp lit on its own, which gave um, the people of Nizza Monferrato hope. Um, and a new surge of energy to fight off the Monferrati. And um, they were victorious. So in honor of that, history is 1613. Um, the, leg the legend of the lamp, the legenda della lampada, the legend of the lamp. So that's where this comes from to honor that region. So I love that story. Um, so what, how does he make this? What is his vision? Um, the very best vines go into this. Um, the very best vines selected as grapes off the bunch go into the Nizza. 20 days maceration in concrete. So just like the other one, and maceration is concrete, but this is 20 days because we're trying to get more tannins and structure out of it. Um, a year in wood, at least, rather than just the six months. So he's looking for a little bit more matured fruit here, conserved black cherry, or maybe cherry under alcohol, uh, maybe some um, prune, um, and then secondary, more developed aromatics of herbs or tobacco, really going for excellent structure to be dry, full-bodied, and round. So, um, there must be some questions about this wine. If does anybody have any questions, or I'll just ask um, Andrea in general to tell us what he's going for. Yeah, I don't. I don't see any questions. So okay. yeah, I would ask Andrea. Andrea, racconta ci qualcosa uh, di di questo vino. Sì, intanto ha uh, un disciplinare differente dal Barbera d'Asti. Viene prodotto solo 70 quintali per ettaro. Deve essere 100% Barbera, viene lasciato poi un anno in botte grande di legno e due anni in bottiglia, come prevede disciplinare. Questo vino ha una struttura molto più, molto più elevata, un po' più alcolico del Barbera d'Asti, più struttura, più corpo, anche perché deve reggere nel tempo e lasciando nel legno il tannino del legno col tannino del vino fa sì che questo vino sia proprio più complesso e in questo caso si sente anche la nota stessa del legno che non è mai invasiva e riusciamo sempre a percepire che si tratta di uva e comunque di vino barbera. So he's, you know, following what Nizza traditionally is and what it requires, what the disciplinary requires. So starting out in the vineyard, um, it's you know 70 uh, quint quintals per hectare. So reduced uh, production. Um, in addition to the one year in wood, then there's two years bottle of aging. And you know he's looking for increased structure. You're gonna find that in this wine, increased alcohol, you know, a little bit over the previous wine, increased body. So this one does see some of that wood. So you're getting, um, you know, he wants to make sure that you're getting some tannins from the, the grape itself because it's coming from longer maceration, but also you're gonna get some even from the um, used large wood. So he's looking for complexity and roundness, um, complexity in the flavors um, and developed and uh, more roundness. Mm. 
and I'm just getting that touch on the nose where, you know, you're, you're walking into a barrel room. Um, lovely. I must say when I, when I tried this wine with Andrea in January, uh, we, we were going in the, the exact order we're going in now is the order we went and um, we went, Andrea presented his, his wines in this order. Um, so to go from the Picona uh, to the Nizza was a big jump. Um, and I think my, um, my taste buds weren't ready for it. <laughs> Again, this was like, you know, 10, 11 in the morning. Um, and my in, initial instinct for me personally is I thought, I thought it was like too structured, you know, um, but, uh, but it, it's also, it's also very age worthy. Giusto si può invecchiare questo vino? Sì, sì, è un vino che quello che state assaggiando in 2017 ma si sente ancora molto la sua giovinezza, è un vino che dura anche oltre vent'anni. Diciamo che secondo me l'ideale da berlo è fra due o tre anni ancora, lasciarlo ancora due o tre anni riposare e poi inizia a essere pronto per la beva. So he likes it to, um, if you just give it a couple, his ideal time would be two to three years still from now, ancora. Um, so after... Um, Two to three years from now, that's like the best window then through the next 20 years as it evolves. Um, I am completely enjoying this wine. To me, it went in with this perfect, you know, satinata. I went in satin with this just perfect amount of, you know, weight. And then it spread out into um, this really nice balance of acidity and tannin structure. But it was, to me, it was not like, the tannins were overbearing and it took away from the wine. It was actually holding in the flavors. So that's one of the things I like about tannin is what it'll like going, oh, I'm holding those flavors right there on your tongue. That's what this was doing for me. And, and it is, is it, it's a darker fruit, but it's not, um, I would say plum rather than prune. So I would change that slide, take prune away. It's a fresher, dark fruit. So um, dark cherries, uh, blackberry. Um you know, a little bit of um, baking spice in there. Well, you know, it's also interesting, Mary Beth, is I tasted it in January and now it's mm -hmm. uh, October. So it's not qu quite a year, but um, I, I found in general with wines that I import in, um, I'll, I'll taste them over time and then they get better. It's yeah. fantastic. Yeah. And on the, uh, on the finish, very long. And I'm getting, um, the, you know, the aromas coming back into my nose are very, complex of, of um, baking spices and, um, you know, secondary and tertiary aromas. I, I'm loving it. So, bravo. Mi piace tantissimo. È molto complesso. E sì. Arriva con uh, satinata, ma è, è corposa, con uh, una bilancia de, del tannini che ho spiegato che, che tiene... Um, Nel tempo. Gusti su, sulla bocca che rimane, mi piace, mi piace tantissimo. Quello rimane, sì. <ride> e, e, il retro gusto è molto aromatico. So there's, there's, a, there's a luxuriousness to this um, uh, wine. Um, it's kind of got an exotic flavor. So um, I think, um, Andrea, um, ricordami um, i cibi che piace, i piatti. Um, I'm asking for... Um, the the foods that he likes to serve with this wine. Uh, con questo vino mm, conviene assaggiare berlo con dei vini con delle carni o, o i nostri arrosti di bue grasso che è proprio molto grasso piuttosto che con la selvaggina con dei formaggi saporiti come il castelmagno come potrebbe essere la fontina quindi dei formaggi invecchiati oppure anche da meditazione con amici dopo cena mm -hmm. per la mm -hmm. quando si fa tra amici. So um, larger roasts or big um, grilled like Fiorentina, um, uh, fatty grilled meats would be great with this um, or um, really nice cheeses, the um, stagionato aged cheeses are beautiful with this wine. 
Um, yeah, that would be fantastic. And, or just a wine of meditation, as they say, just sitting around um, the fire or um, wherever with your friends. This one is, is very, very nice for late in the evening. I would, I enjoy it. Okay. Fantastic. Okay. Are there any questions on this wine before we go on to leaving these table uh, reds and then moving to the sweet wines? Okay, we already saw the map. We're moving to the sweet. We're moving to Moscato d'Asti and we're moving then to um, um, Brachetto. So both of these are sweet wines and both of these are frizzante or slightly um, fizzy wines. And we're gonna start with the white first, which is the Moscato d'Asti. Okay. Vero, vero Andrea? Cominciamo con questo, non sì, il bracchetto. Sì. Allora, prima Moscato. Okay. okay. E, e, I gotta remember what language I'm supposed to be speaking. I was supposed to be speaking to you. Okay, switch, switch, switch. <laughs> English. Um, now, um, the uh, Moscato d'Asti, you know, as we said before, historic, historic um, grape known for being highly aromatic. So I think everybody on this call already is familiar with the Moscato grape that is so inviting, that has natural aromas of, you know, orange blossom, honey, uh, grape. Um, what, what am I missing? Apricot. Um, those types of things, highly, highly aromatic. Um, one of the most aromatic wines in the world, if not the most aromatic wine in the world, that is white. Semi-sparkling. Um, and this is semi-sparkling wine is not made in the traditional method. It doesn't have a second fermentation. It's just a first fermentation where in order to capture the sweetness, we stop the fermentation early. And in order to capture um, the bubbles also, we stop, we uh, bottle early, we put the, uh, the cap on it. So that's how the style is made in a tiny little nutshell. <laughs> um, and um, Andrea, um, voi dire qualcosa della, del metodo produzione? Per, ho spiegato un, un piccolissimo, se c'è qualcosa che volete, voi dire, per ricordare le gente. Il moscato viene fatto, si fa, ferment, si fa una prima una fermentazione dove però poi a un certo punto viene bloccata per mantenere questa dolcezza, gli zuccheri. Il moscato viene fatto nell'autoclave, quindi con metodo Charmat. Quando si arriva a 5 di alcol, col freddo e con una filtrazione, si blocca la fermentazione, ma si mantiene la CO2 per, per far sì che sia frizzante in bottiglia. Questo vino eh, ha la caratteristica di essere dolce, ma a differenza dei miei colleghi, non troppo dolce, quindi solo 120-130 grammi litri di zuccheri. Un, un alcol che va dai 5-5,5, così rimane bilanciato, acidità, alcol e eh, zuccheri. Ok, perfetto. Um, this wine, you know, as as tradition uh, um, calls for, the, the wine ferments and um, then it is um, the alcohol, the fermentation is stopped. Once it gets to five um, degrees of alcohol, 5% alcohol, it's chilled down, it's filtered, then it's um, to stop the fermentation, then it's put in an autoclave, so a pressurized tank to hold in the bubbles until it's ready for bottling. Um, one of the things that he does differently than some of his neighbors is, you know, this is supposed to be a sweet wine to a semi-sweet wine. He makes sure that it's not too sweet. He wants a balance between the sweetness, the alcohol and the bubbles. So um, 120 to, um, did you say 120 to 150 grams per liter? I didn't, uh, I didn't catch uh, it. Uh, e, um, uh, zucchero residuo uh, fra 120 e 150? 120-130. Oh, 120-130. Uh, sorry. 120 to 130 grams per liter is what he's looking for um, for um, the, the sugar on here. 
So the style is pleasantly sweet with a palate freshness, aromas, honey and acacia and chamomile. Um, and think of both desserts with this, but absolutely great where the red, we wanted it with the aged cheeses. This is great with um, fresh cheeses and, and fruit. I love the comparison of chamomile to this, uh, to this wine. It's like, I mean, even the concept of, of having chamomile tea, you know, you, you have chamomile tea. I don't know. I have it when I want to just relax. I mean, obviously, you know, if I want to sleep or whatever, but it's sort of like this, um, it's soothing, um, and it's just delicate. Um, I am definitely getting flavors here. Of it's like chamomile tea with honey in it. I, mean, I can taste yeah. those yeah. Honey, honeyed flavors that Moscato is so known for. And um, you know, we have Moscato here that's produced in the United States, but it doesn't have this as much. This is just bursting with with flavors. Esplode con i, i, i gusti, i aromi, and nella oh. bocca, sulla bocca. Mm. John, uh, did you try this wine at the cave or any of his wines? Do you remember? Yes, here. Yes, yes, I Because I, I remember uh, we, we at the, this event that we had 10 days ago here in Ventura, we had um, the Picona Barbera Dasti, we had the Moscato Dasti. And then we also had the next wine, the Bracato d'Aqui. Do, do you remember which ones you tried? I have them written. And in fact, I sent you an email of the two, the, the three that I tried. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm pretty sure you tried the Barbera. I did. I tried the Barbera. I did yeah. the Barolo. And then I tried a white. Okay, yeah, so it probably wasn't, um, it probably wasn't the, these last two, the sweet ones. No, but I did try a white. I mean, I must say at, at wine tastings, um, uh, with, you know, consumers, um, when, um, when people come to try wine, I, I always ask them, you know, what, typically what do you drink? And, and certainly nine times out of 10, it's, it's a dry wine. Um, but there is that one out of 10 that, <laughs> that just likes sweet wines. And in fact, I remember there, there was a woman that came to, to the table and, 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 and she was that one, one out of 10 and tried this Moscato and loved it. I mean, one of the, I can see this obviously um, with desserts, but I would love to see it in place of, because there's just enough sweetness here. So let's say brunch, you could have it like with a French toast that only has the lightest drizzle of um, of uh, um, maple syrup because you don't need it. Mm -hmm. You okay. just have the fruit on it and then you drink this with it. That's providing the sweetness because it's got such a honeyed, honeyed flavor. And um, there's so much, so much fruit quality to it. So um, That's a good point. it's very, very beautiful. So sometimes I like to think of wines as being the accent to replace a sauce, to replace mm -hmm. a condiment, mm -hmm. um, instead of trying to figure out, it's just like, yeah, it becomes the, it becomes the condiment. Yeah, that's a great idea. Um, and just, uh, uh, just a, a fun fact, th this wine and the next one um, are so low in alcohol that it doesn't even qualify as wine, according to the US government. Uh, it was my first time encountering this as an importer. Um, but that's, I was thinking when you mentioned brunch, like that, that's the nice thing about a brunch wine too, is you don't, you want it to be low in alcohol. So, right, so. right. Okay. Yeah. And, 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 um, you know, some, some of us really like, like say a butter cookie, you know, something that's not, it's like a, or a cantuccio that's not too sweet. It's got the almonds in it. So this would be good with like almonds, nuts, um, you know, even less sweet cookies um, if you like that sweetness. But if you, there's so much nice acidity in here that if you don't like things as sweet, you don't like your wine as sweet as this might be to you, you save this for your desserts 
And what it's going to do is going to just block your perception of that level of sweetness in the wine. And so all you're going to get is this perfect level of semi touch of sweetness with the acidity, with the brightness, with the bubbles. So that's why we generally say, um, you know, there's two ways of doing this, but we generally say sweet wine goes with sweet food. It's to cut your perception of the sweetness in the wine. But if you love the sweetness in the wine, play it up, do it with a butter cookie, do it with almonds, um, have it be the sweetness with your, um, your French toast instead of the maple syrup. I don't mean pour it on there. I just, you know. No, I, th I think that these suggestions are great. I mean, given that I've been living in Italy for, you know, 20 years, but of course I'm an American, like I've been noticing that in, in America, you know, we, you know, we have, we have certain traditions like brunch is not a, a tradition in, uh, in, in Italy, but, but there's some traditions in Italy that I like that we don't have in the U.S. And I think um, this uh, suggestion of having a Moscato d'Asti at brunch is like a great combining of the two. Yeah. <laughs> Andrea, ho spiegato che um, per tradizione in Italia si mangia, um, si, si beve questo con i dolci. Ma anche mm. in California, negli Stati Uniti, di solito diciamo con un vino dolce è buono. Uh, di bere con i dolci e questo um, anche cambia un po' il gusto per, per le persone che non, non vogliono troppo dolcezza nel vino ridurre sembra che ridurre un po' la dolcezza ma ho detto ho, ho suggerito per le persone che piace il gusto di, del dolce che vogliono questo dolce e c'è miele su questo mm. um, su molto miele e, e camomile uh, ho detto magari um, um, bere questo con i, i, le mandorle arrostiti oppure um, i do, dolci che non sono troppo dolce invece sì, del, oh. del sugo zuccherato Solo mangiare in, in America c'è French toast e di solito um, mette molto sciroppa dolce dopo sopra, ma non mettere quello. Mangia questo che è un po pochino dolce. Questo. Adesso qua in Piemonte alcuni lo abbinano con del formaggio fresco, una robiola fresca, fresca, fresca. I love it. So he says a lot of people now are doing it with the freshest, freshest cheeses. So if you haven't had robiola yet, they know I know that they sell it. I was so excited when I saw that they sell robiola in um in in nicer grocery stores or nicer fromagerias, you know, here. I say fromageria, they're not called that in the United States. <laughs> Cheesemongers. Um and um that would be because that is very fresh. That would be perfect. It's like, you know how you would put a cheese, you'd put a fresh cheese tray out and you would drizzle it with honey, maybe. Or you just put fruit around it. Yeah, perfect. Perfezione. Okay, there is, if there's no other questions on this wine, we've got to move on to one that maybe some of you have never tried before. It is a more unique wine to the United States, to the um, American drinker. And that is the Susbel Bracchetto, Bracchetto d'Aqui, Bracchetto d'Aqui. And just like Moscato d'Asti, it's the Muscat grape that's grown in the Asti region. This is the Bracchetto grape that's grown in the Aqui region, which is a little bit um, further. Um, it's on the southern part of the Monferrato. It is a DOCG, and it is famous for being a sweet frizzante, which means semi-sparkling red. So Bracchetto, another highly, highly aromatic grape. Where is my, I used the wrong glass. All right, we're gonna put this one in a big glass because it's here. So do you see it coming out? Fine bubbles and this gorgeous, oh, the lighting in here is just not picking it up. Mm -hmm. It's a gorgeous, gorgeous, like a raspberry colored, raspberry between strawberry and raspberry colored, slightly fizzy wine. And the Italians do um, have this as a dessert or with desserts, especially chocolate desserts, strawberry desserts, or having it directly with strawberries. Um, in the United States, I've known people and in Italy who you know bring this out for dessert at a wedding because it's kind of like the uh, the wine of love. 
But the brachetto grape itself is wonderful. I, um, I've i actually had brachetto um, dry, but that is not traditional. And it's very, very, very hard to find as a table wine. Um, but it's Nizza Monferrato is where it's grown. It's macerated on the skins for three to four days to be able to bring out the color, right? And we want to have some tannins in this one, whereas the white, we're not looking for tannins. But we, um, Andrea wants some tannins in this. Fermentation stopped at about six and a half alcohol. So it's a little bit higher than the other one, but we're stopping it to maintain the sweetness and sweet, delicate with structure on this. Aromatics, you're going to get roses and strawberries is kind of like classic. So I'm going in. I haven't had a taste of this one yet and I can't wait because it's like, for me, I remember when I first tried Brachetto, I thought, not supposed to like a sweet red wine. This was a long time ago. And it was just like this guilty pleasure. Oh my God, it's so good. So here we go. Mm. Mm. I swallow that. I didn't spit it. <laughs> oh, okay. So what, ah, oh, there's a complexity to this grape. There's a, there's an earthiness to it. There's some layers of flavor to the fruit. Yes. That, you know, the, um, there's strawberries highlighted in it, but this isn't just a, a sweet wine. It's not just the grape itself has got a lot of character. Mm. And Andrea has pulled it out, pulled the layers out in this. Andrea, tell us, hey. raccontaci qualcosa di questo vino. È, è un vino del, del tuo cuore? <laughs> No, io sono più amante della Barbera. <laughs> I asked him if it, was the, if it was the wine of his heart, and he said, ah, he's a little bit, a little bit uh, more connected to uh, Barbera for his heart. Qua si dice che è il vino delle donne, perché è dolce, e allora a tutte le donne piace. Quindi è un vino delle donne. Questo è un vino che ricorda tanto i petali di rosa, quindi molto fruttato, delicato. È un vino difficile, il moscato... È più facile da vendere, più conosciuto. Il bracchetto è il fratello minore. Questo si abbina con dei dessert delicati, con dei cioccolati, ma non troppo, non troppo forti. Quindi se si parla di un cioccolato eh, nero, massimo un 50%, 60%. Okay. Oppure con le fragole. Qua si abbina tanto con le fragole. Una coppa di vino con all'interno 5-6 fragole e diventa una, buon, una buona merenda, un, un delizioso dessert. Eh, yeah. um, he said this one, um, you know, in Italy, it's kind of um, a, a, a woman's wine. Women really like this wine. Um, so let's just say that everybody who's got, um, wants something a little bit light, a little bit sweet, a little bit festive would like this. Um, he said it's a little bit harder to sell because people just don't know it well, I guess in Italy as well. And I, I think that might be true from having, I lived in Italy for five years and um, I lived in the North. So I knew of, I knew of it and I drank it there, but I didn't, I didn't hear about it when I traveled to, to other regions. Um, yeah, I think I just want to make a quick comment that in, in, in Italy, um, I remember, um, I mean, I've been in Italy for 20 years and I remember the first couple of years buying a Brachetto d'Aqui Kind of by mistake, I, I didn't know it was sweet. Um, and to be honest, I what it wasn't it wasn't Andrea's wine, but I, I wasn't impressed. Um, I've had it. I, I think a, a lot um, for for some of these wines that we're having, Moscato d'Asti for sure, and I would say also Brachetto d'Aqui. Um, some of these are uh, kind of like high volume high volume sold wines in the sense that they're not um uh they're not really artisanally made and uh that one of the things that struck me about andrea's wines not and i'm focusing more on the moscato da dasti and this brachetto is that there there was there was structure to it you know there's like the fact that there it's a uh, slightly tannic, but I you know, the fact that he, he wants those answers. It makes it, as a sommelier, it, it makes it a better wine. Yeah, there, there's definitely, I mean, I can feel the tannins in there. It's very light, 
but it adds that structure. It adds a little bit of seriousness. You can tell this is artisanal and it's not just made in high production. So it's, it's really lovely. Um, it is um, served with lighter desserts. So I could, I could see it um, like with a pandoro or a angel food cake, or you kind of flip it and because something that's just, or maybe not angel food cake, maybe that's too sweet. Maybe like a pound cake, I mean, like a pound cake mm -hmm. um, or chocolate desserts that are at least, you know, 50% cacao. So darker chocolates. So this is that, you know, this is that cherry or, you know, raspberry, strawberry filling um, for a, a chocolate. So, um, but some people put strawberry, put it in a glass, put strawberry on the side, or actually sometimes put even put strawberries inside the glass and it just becomes a real, um, you know, a treat Think about um, welcoming somebody with a glass on a, on a summer afternoon, or it can be just, it can be a snack um, in the middle of the afternoon or it can be an aperitif. So that's what Andrea was, was letting us know. Well, I don't think uh, we have any questions. I know we, we went way over. I personally have really enjoyed this uh, wine class and tasting. Both Mary Beth, your uh, your 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 way of uh, teaching is very engaging. Um, I enjoy it. And Andrea, grazie mille per uh, per tutta l'informazione. Tu progetto è molto bello. I was just saying how uh, I, a lot of times I call uh, since Vero specializes in small wineries. I, I call them projects because uh, that's sort of what they are. They're these you know unique. Um, creations and um, and that's what uh, what I like about his wines. Um, so um, so unless there's any other questions, uh, I um, as you may have seen in the chat, of course, all these wines are available on verovinogusto.com. Uh, since Andrea is the first, uh, this is the first time he his wines are in the U.S. Uh, one of the reasons why, why we hold this Avero talk is also to get the word out to distributors around the United States, to wine stores and restaurants uh, that are interested in, in these wines. And, uh, and as always, um, consumers can buy directly from us online uh, on verovinoguso.com. And um, so... Oh, oh, hey, Elaine. Hi. Sorry, I didn't want to interrupt you. Um, no, I just wanted to thank you and um, for organizing this. And just to, you, Sheila, and Mary Beth, you know, your fantastic combination. It's really um, very educative as well um, as interesting. Um, and just as a side note to someone who might not have been to this area yet. Uh, by coincidence, last weekend, um, because my husband belongs to a classic car um, club, the X, X Uno Nove, I don't, uh, Bertone, I don't know what it's called in, in English. And they went around um, and we were in um, Asti Monferrato and driving around the hills, you know, of course, with the classic cars, you know, these guys, you know, that's what they like to do. And so we were just going through these winding hills and it is magnificent. It is absolutely out of this world. Um, every time you go around a curve, it's a picture. Mm -hmm. um, it really is lovely. And the quality of everything that you find is really superior, is really superior. And you can see everything in the attention to detail and the, the order and the cleanliness and, and um, the traditions that are in the area are, are really worth, you know, um, worth seeing and worth um, experiencing if someone has the, the chance to be there. Um, we didn't taste any of these particular wines. Obviously, I didn't see his winery because we were further west, um, but they're very well known and very well esteemed in, in all of Italy. You know, so this is really good. Uh, I'm sorry I didn't have it to taste it, you know. I mean, you've made me, my mouth water. Oh, you will. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for adding that, Elaine. Um, that's it, that's a really good first person perspective on just the beauty of the area. Thank you. And I will say that I am left with a um, un, un retro gusto and an aftertaste of this. That again, I, I am staying with 
there is a little bit of bitterness. There's a little bit of structure on here. So that sweetness comes, you know, that sweetness is there in the beginning, but the struttura, un po' tanino, comes in afterwards. So I've swallowed it a long time ago and I'm still tasting it, but I'm feeling it on the palate. It's not just a, a light, you know, whatever sweet wine. It's a lovely wine and very well made. Cheers, Andrea. Grazie. Complimenti, Andrea. Grazie. Cheers. Right, cheers. Thank you, uh, Sheila and Mary Beth. And Andrea, thank, <laughs> thank you, you very much. And we look forward to meeting Andrea in May, May. of this next year. Ciao. Quindi Andrea, loro vengono a trovarti in maggio. Ok, vi aspetto. Vi <laughs> aspetto, grazie. Thank you, ciao. 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 Ciao, ciao, ciao. Wonderful, wonderful. So informative. Oh. Okay, Devo uh, and I, I have to pee really badly. <laughs> Enjoy the rest of the wines. Thank you. I will. <laughs> ciao. Ciao.